North Carolina's Outer Banks are a beautiful place to vacation, but building and maintaining towns on an ever-shifting sandbar is a lot easier said than done. But with a median home price of around $900,000 per house and a total GDP of around $10 billion, there's significant incentive to keep the island chain open for business and the buildings as protected as possible, even if that means replacing small bridges with very large ones and occasionally playing high-stakes games of Jenga. The Outer Banks are a series of barrier islands and peninsulas off the coast of mainland North Carolina. They were formed when a large series of sand dunes were tall enough to survive the melting glaciers. Given their location and geological makeup, they've always been susceptible to shifting and changing. At some points in history, some of the islands have been peninsulas and some of the peninsulas have been islands. The total number of islands has changed as well, as both regular currents and one-off storms are constantly reshaping the Outer Banks. Before Europeans first reached the islands in the 1500s, semi-nomadic Native Americans inhabited the island chain, utilizing it for its abundant natural resources, particularly during the warm summer months. Despite the island being permanently inhabited for close to 500 years now, building and maintaining these developments has always been a challenge. The first, and perhaps most glaring modern example of this, can be found in the town of Rodanthe. This town, with only a population of a few hundred, is situated at one of the most narrow sections of Hatteras Island. It also happens to be one of the areas experiencing some of the most persistent beach erosion. Some areas of the island are losing as much as 10 feet of beach per year. The result has been that beach houses and infrastructure that were seemingly a safe distance away from the water not so long ago are now perilously close to the waves, and in some cases, houses have actually collapsed back into the ocean. There's some things that can be done to address this, but just about all the options are expensive. Some homeowners have decided to move their homes or raise their homes, a complex and expensive undertaking. And perhaps even bigger issue than the cost is where do you move it to? While there are thicker and thinner sections of the island, it's pretty much everywhere on the island that's vulnerable to beach erosion and strong storms. Another option is large scale beach reclamation. But this is like trying to plug a leaking dam with chewing gum. While it may work temporarily in specific locations, it's not a permanent fix, and it's expensive enough that it's not something that can be afforded to be done everywhere across the Outer Banks, leaving just a few winners and a lot of losers. The cost to reclaim the beach at Rodanthe alone is estimated to be around $40 million. Since neither of these are spectacular options, a lot of homeowners have decided to go with the third option, do nothing, let the house collapse back into the ocean, pay to clean up the mess, and then collect the insurance money. This clearly isn't a great option either, but given the financial realities of the situation, it's pretty understandable that a number of homeowners would decide to go this route. Unfortunately, it's not just the houses that are threatened. Perhaps even more important than the houses is the main road leading down the island that connects the small towns. In recent years, strong storms have taken out entire sections of the island, including the road with it, severing the artery that connects the island to the mainlands. Here's a section of the road that was taken out by a strong storm in 2011. This was a critical situation as just about everybody south was effectively cut off from the mainland. A temporary bridge was built as the section of the island was rebuilt, then a permanent bridge was put on top of the reclaimed land. This is only one section though, and the reality is that this is likely to continue up and down the island in coming years. In some places, the state has made an effort to proactively address these issues. One of the largest examples of this can be found just north of Rodanthe. Following the road being washed out in 2011, a permanent causeway was built where the road had previously been. But the new bridge didn't just go over one section. In an effort to future-proof the project, a new 2.5-mile bridge was constructed over the Palmaco Sound, bypassing the whole section that was at risk. The existing road was abandoned and has since been covered by the dunes, and all traffic was diverted to this new bridge. The hope is that if and when the ocean does cut through the island again, it'll cut through the bypass section, keeping the road access open. Another large example of this can be seen at Oregon Inlet. This is a notorious inlet that was first cut by a major storm in September of 1846. Prior to that, there was no gap in this section of the island, but in the 200 years since its formation, it's become famous for its challenging currents and constantly evolving shape. Over the years, it's been the site of a number of incidents and accidents as a result of these, including one where a runaway barge lost control and was swept into the Bonner Bridge that traversed the inlet. 
So keeping this safe and passable for both cars and boats has always been a challenge. In the early 2000s, it was clear that the existing Bonner Bridge was reaching the end of its useful lifespan. The old bridge had received a score of 4 out of 100, with 1 being the most dangerous and 100 being the safest. Further reports from the bridge inspectors revealed that the old bridge had reached a critical level of degradation and would need to be closed immediately. It remained closed for several weeks as remedial actions were taken to shore up the bridge. At the same time, a replacement bridge was being worked on. In 2019, that new bridge opened over the inlet, significantly longer and taller than the previous bridge. More importantly was the larger and deeper foundations that the new bridge got, making it much more resistant to the strong currents and ever-shifting sands. The new bridge cost $250 million to make. Although most of the old bridge was demolished, a section was kept as a fishing pier, and walking up that pier in the shadows of the massive new bridge gives a fascinating perspective of just how much bigger and stronger the new bridge is than the previous one, and how important the state of North Carolina saw this project to be. Further down the Outer Banks lies another inlet that's completely transformed in the last 50 years. This was cut during the same storm that cut Oregon Inlet in 1846, but for much of its time, it's been fairly narrow. As recently as the 1980s, it was only about a quarter mile across, but that's all changed in recent years as currents and storms have widened the gap substantially to just around two and a half miles as of 2025. With all these unpredictable coastlines, complex currents, and underwater dangers, not to mention the regular storms that the Outer Banks are particularly susceptible to, the area has been an absolute nightmare for ships, particularly before the days of sonar and GPS. An estimated two to 3,000 ships have met their fate in and around the Outer Banks, earning the nickname the Graveyard of the Atlantic. The earliest recorded shipwreck in the area dates back to 1526, and the most recent was during Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Ships of all kinds have been lost here, from schooners to steamers, battleships, and submarines. Notable wrecks include the USS Huron, which ran aground in 1877 during a storm, and the famous ironclad ship, the USS Monitor, as well as the infamous Blackbeard's flagship, the Queen Anne's Revenge. During World War II, the area off of Cape Hatteras also got the nickname Torpedo Junction, as it saw numerous sinkings by German U-boats, adding a wartime dimension to the long list of maritime dangers. Many of the wrecks lie close enough to the shore that they can be explored by divers and kayakers, Another cool thing that the Outer Banks has going for it. And I touched on it briefly, but it's hard to talk about the Outer Banks without mentioning its storied pirate history. During the 17th and 18th century, the region's proximity to major shipping lanes made it a strategic hotspot for pirates who preyed on merchant vessels traveling along the coast. The geography of the Outer Banks, with its numerous inlets and hidden coves, provided ideal hiding places for these pirates to evade capture and stash their plunder. One of the most infamous pirates associated with the area was Blackbeard, whose flagship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, wrecked in 1718. But Blackbeard wasn't the only one. Even some Outer Banks locals got in on the action. Some unscrupulous individuals known as wreckers would sometimes deliberately mislead ships with false lights from the shore in an attempt to cause a wreck, and then they would salvage valuable goods. And finally, the most consequential contribution to modern life from the Outer Banks came a little over 100 years ago, back in 1903. On December 17, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright achieved the world's first controlled powered flight at Kill Devil Hills near Kitty Hawk. Their aircraft, the Wright Flyer, stayed up for about 12 seconds and covered 120 feet, proving that powered flight in a heavier-than-air craft was possible. It wasn't an accident that the Wright brothers ended up on the Outer Banks. Many of the geological and climatological things that I've already talked about in this video contributed to the choice. They needed a location with steady winds for lift, tall sand dunes for launching, and soft sand for relatively safe landings, as well as isolation to ensure privacy during their experiments. The Outer Banks of North Carolina, with its consistent winds, wide open spaces, and tall sand dunes at Kill Devil Hills, provided the ideal environment for their work. North Carolina's aviation history goes beyond the Wright brothers. Well before 1903, 
Local inventors like Henry Gatling and Daniel Asbury were experimenting with early aircraft. And after the Wright brothers' success, North Carolina remained the leader in aviation innovation for decades. The state became a hub for pilot training during World War II and has had a major aerospace research and manufacturing base in cities like Charlotte and Winston-Salem. So there you have it, a vacation to the Outer Banks building tales style. Definitely would recommend going, and with it changing as much as it is, it's probably not a bad idea to go sooner rather than later, just to make sure it's still there. The beaches and water sports are amazing, but there's so much more to the barrier island chain if you look just a little below the surface. Thanks for watching. On to Cincinnati in a couple weeks, so if you have any cool suggestions for where I should go or what I should do for that video, let me know in the comments section. And as always, please like and subscribe if you want to support the channel and make it just a little bit easier for me to keep these videos coming.